All right, pray with me and we'll dive right in. Father God, thank you that we're here this morning. Thank you that we can gather in this place. And Father, I pray that today that you would be present um, in the midst of us, that as we open your word and as we seek to understand you, as we seek to find you and to understand who you are, that indeed you will reveal yourself to us through your word. Give us attentive ears, but also attentive hearts. There's very likely someone here who desperately needs to understand how deeply loved they are by you and to find rest and satisfaction in that. We pray that you would be lifted up in all that we say. In Jesus' name, amen. So, there are a couple of sermon titles that I remember that have stuck in my mind. Most people probably remember a meaningful line from a message or a sermon. Um, and there's probably a couple of those that if I thought really hard, I would remember. But there's, there's a couple of sermon titles that stick out to me. Um, one is, and you probably had to study it in, in school like I did, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I don't know what it is about that title, it just sort of, I remember that, right? Sinners in, that's Jonathan Edwards, and um, sinners in the hands of an angry God. You, it just sticks, right? There's another sermon that a dear, dear pastor, friend of mine, uh, preached many years ago. And the title of that sermon was, Fair is for Five-Year-Olds. Fair is for Five-Year-Olds. Maybe it's the alliteration, and I don't know. But again... I remember that sermon. I don't remember the titles of most other sermons. I'm not even sure what my title is today. But, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God and Fairs for Five-Year-Olds stands out. And there's, just in the, in the title of Fairs for Five-Year-Olds alone, just in the title alone, you can somewhat determine kind of what the message is about, right? You kind of get the idea that sometimes you and I look for fairness or justice or or a sense of being right or wrong or and we're definitely on the side of right we when we have certain expectations because built within us innate to us is this sense of right and wrong this sense of of justice and when we see where there is no justice we are quick to call it out especially if it if it involves me not getting fair treatment I'm really quick to call it out so that someone can rectify and make right what, is been, what has been done wrong here, right? It's kind of how we are. And yet, throughout that message, throughout that sermon, you just kept getting the idea that, man, fair really is for five-year-olds. Because you remember when you were five... If you grew up with a sibling, or like me, I'm an only child, so I had cousins. But when we fought, when we tussled, when we, when we were doing something that we weren't supposed to do, it always seemed like I was the one that got in trouble. Because it's never the instigator that gets caught. It's always the, the retaliator, right? So if you guys are going back and forth, you and your sibling in the backseat of the car, and and your sister whacks you across the face for no reason. Your parent only turns around at the moment that you're about to haul off and hit her back, right? And then you get busted. Or if you're, if you're, in the, if you're somewhere that you're not supposed to be, maybe you're, okay, classic example, getting the cookie from the cookie jar. Your partner in crime always seems to be able to get the cookie, walk away clean. But the parent walks around the corner when you're reaching, and the, and the, 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 the one who got away scot free is like, I have no idea what's going on here. No. Right? You had, you had one of those siblings that was like the angel, and you were the devil. Right? Every time something went down, the parent kind of looked at you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And you're, you're, you're the, the baby of the family is kind of go over here going, mm-hmm. Right? They get away with stuff, but not you. And in you, there wells up within you the sense of, ah, it's not fair. It's not right. You don't know, mom and dad, that little person over the here that you brought into the world is a sinner. 
<laughs> you just never catch them sinning. I promise you they are, right? It's just sort of the way it goes down because you know that justice must be served and it never seems quite fair that you get left holding the bag every, every time. Don't you wish there had been like instant replay for your family back then? That would have been great. They have it in sports now, but if there was instant replay, like if there's like on every family, just a camera, like on the children, and when something went down, you say, mom, watch the tape. Just watch the tape. You'll see, you'll see everything that went down. Both guilty here, both guilty. That would be nice. Does it change when we get older? No, doesn't change when we get older. There's still this innate sense of justice and fairness that we sort of wrestle with, especially when it comes to us not being treated fairly or someone in our family. Think, think of the parent, you know, maybe you're, as a parent, maybe your kid doesn't make the team. And little Johnny really isn't that great of an athlete. He probably shouldn't make the team, but he doesn't make the team. And you're like, come on, why did my kid? You go to the coach, you make your appeals. You just kind of, you just kind of feel treated like, nah, that's, that's not the way things are supposed to go. My child is being mistreated. And then if your kid makes the team, you want to see parents act like complete and utter, there's probably words I can't use in church, but if your kid makes the team and you're a parent in the stands, I know there are stories of police officers being called to games, yeah. Because those refs aren't calling this game right. That was a bad call. My kid got, my kid got called for something that they didn't do. All right, there's this, it's not fair. My team is doing everything they can do to win and somehow these refs are undermining them every step along the way. Well, here's the thing. If you follow the life of Jesus long enough, you'll begin to figure out real quick, you'll begin to see throughout the gospels, in fact, that there are moments, very powerful moments in the gospels where Jesus confronts our innate sense of justice and fairness. More importantly though, and this is very true, very appropriate for us as Christ followers, as Christians here today, he surgically dismantles our sense of self-righteousness. Because in all of this sort of underlying sense of justice and, 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 and righteousness is in fact that sense that we have it together, that we are righteous, that we are good, that, that we have done our part and there's no way we should be treated this way, right? We all sort of deal with it. Here's an instance um, it's not the one that we're going to focus on completely during our time this morning. But here's an instance where Jesus confronts self-righteousness among those who profess to be his followers. John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. This is, where, this is that story where, where they find the woman caught in adultery, caught in sin. And they bring her out, drag her out in front of Jesus. And this is Jesus' response. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she responds. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Religious leaders bring this woman before Jesus. Jesus kneels down, begins to write in the sand. All of them walk away, nothing left to say. And Jesus tells this one, look around. There's nobody here to condemn you. I don't condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin, Jesus, tearing down any sense of fairness, tearing down any sense of self-righteousness, basically telling those who would stand around and cast stones and, and, and cast judgment and demand fairness, you have no room to talk. You can't talk. You can't talk. And how appropriate for Jesus to say such a thing, how appropriate for Jesus to say such a thing, because in, in, the, in, the, in the grand story of salvation, in, in, in the story that draws us all here each and every week, and what, what causes us to 
to, to seek Christ out every day of the week. Underlying it is this beautiful passage found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, you have no room to talk. When, when fairness should have been demanded for you and for God, God did something totally different. When justice should have been demanded for you, God called an audible. When you were thrown down and, and everything was against you and, and you should have been the one stoned and condemned and treated the way you deserve to be treated, the Bible says that God made him who had no sin, who knew no sin, to become sin for you and me so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Love that passage. When we should have been treated as we deserved, the Bible says that God, Jesus, was treated as we deserved. So here's our story. This is where God, where Jesus confronts us with our own sense of justice and self-righteousness and fairness. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, we sing this song, you probably grew up, you know the song Zacchaeus was a wee little man, but a little bit more on Zacchaeus' profile. He was a chief tax collector and quite wealthy. He gained his wealth because he was basically an extortionist. He would, he would, uh, he would collect more taxes than he needed to collect. He would give the Romans what they needed, but he would hang on to as much as he needed to. Worse yet, he was basically uh, working for the other side. He, would, uh, he was basically working for the Romans and he was despised. He was hated. He was seen as a traitor. He was the lowest of the low. There were, you could call him a sinner, and it does in these passages, but there were probably words that they use exclusively for tax collectors, something worse even than just a sinner. But he cheated people. And yet, as we read the passages, we find something interesting about Zacchaeus. Go with me to uh, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. We'll read the entire story through 10 verses. Follow along with me, please. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was quite wealthy. Verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way. Verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Verse 7. All the people saw this and began to mutter. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Is that fair? Verse 8, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, today, today, salvation has come into this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and to save who was lost. So if you take that, you take that story and you see how Jesus sort of confronts our own sense of fairness and self-righteousness, you can't help but see a powerful story of how one comes to salvation. You can't help but see where one is confronted with a sense of their own um, uh, lack of righteousness and then they, they, they become so aware of it that they seek the one out who they believe can absolutely give them what it is they so desire. And so that's the case with Zacchaeus. Three things I want us to notice here. Three things that I think are absolutely critical. 
It'll both help us get rid of, remedy our issue with our own sense of having to have fairness and our own sense of self-righteousness. But it also, it'll also help us to understand and see more clearly who this Jesus is and what the experience of salvation means for you and me. Three things. Three things that Zacchaeus shows us. Number one, number one, the experience of salvation involves running and climbing a tree. The experience of salvation involves running and climbing a tree. The second thing is this. Sometimes as we make this journey to understand who this Jesus is, as we seek him out, we will absolutely have to get over the crowd. And the third thing is this. Zacchaeus shows us that salvation demands and it means that we take this Jesus home. We take him home. The first thing, Zacchaeus runs and climbs a tree. The wee little man runs and climbs a tree. Two things here. One thing is that the dude runs. Throughout the gospels, as you see, as, as, people, um, as, as people present children before Jesus, Jesus always affirms children. As, as, as in, in ancient times, children and women were seen as uh, less than. They were way down here. But every time Jesus encounters women and children in the Bible, he lifts them up. He, he validates them. He, anytime you see women and children in Jesus' wake, if they come behind him, they're doing much better than they were before Jesus got there. And so one of the things we learn about salvation from Zacchaeus is that you must become rather childlike. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. But Jesus would also say, if anyone would come after me, let him also become like a child. Do you, do you know how many miles you ran when you were a kid? Right? Were we not always running all the time? And as you get older, you look at your own children or you look at relatives, little children around you, and you marvel at how much energy they have. If we could just bottle that, put it in pill form and take one every morning, we'd be good. Kids are always running. My mom was constantly after me because we, we get out at a store or something. I take off towards the door just to run. I don't have nowhere. I have no idea where I'm going. I'm just running. You gotta, gotta run, gotta run, you gotta go, you gotta get there fast, right? Constantly running. Mom would always get mad at me because you're gonna run out in front of a car, get hit by a car, because we didn't care, we just had to run. An eager expectation of what was to come, something fun or important or inviting was awaiting the end of that run. It is with eager excitement that this Zacchaeus who Jesus, by his spirit, had likely uh, converted prior to this, this episode in his life, had touched his heart. Because the beginning of the story says that, that Zacchaeus had to go and see who this Jesus was and find out more about this Jesus. And like a kid, he runs. There's something about us that maybe, especially if you're a church person, you've been around the church long enough, we stop running we stop pursuing. We stop anticipating this, this Jesus in this church. Y'all stroll in from the parking lot, right? Well, I'll get there. Stop in the lobby and talk with some friends. Jesus will still be there. I, I'm not going to miss him, right? There's something that, that we lose that, that, that drive to be in his presence, to seek him out. Our, our devotions have been reduced to reading a couple of paragraphs in the book. We've slowed way down. Our spiritual metabolism has just sort of crawled to nothing. There's a metaphor in that too. When your metabolism slows and you cease to be active, you get heavy, slow. Slow. 
Zacchaeus is fresh. The gospel is still very new to him. The notion that, that there is so much more to seek with this, with this God and, and a depth of understanding and relationship with this God. He can't help but wait to get into the presence of this God. So he, he, can't, he can't get to Jesus because of the crowd. We'll get to that in a second. But he tries to make maneuvers around. And he climbs up into the tree. Children climb trees. <laughs> There's something very, very, very childlike about climbing a tree. For, an, for a grown man in an ancient world, to climb a tree is highly undignified. That's just not what adult people do. But here's Zacchaeus and his eagerness and his excitement and his energy to find out more about this Jesus, to see this Jesus up close and personal. A grown man, granted he was short, vertically challenged like myself, but nevertheless... He climbs the tree in eager expectation. It may be that the greatest barrier to our spiritual development is that we have way too much dignity and pride. It may be that we sat through a few too many worship services where you had to sit still, be quiet, hands on your lap, and don't make a peep. Don't raise your hands. Lord forbid the spirit get a hold of you and you start moving. Right? We just sort of beat the energy out of folks when they come to church. But Zacchaeus, man, he runs. Cares not about the crowd. Doesn't matter. That's one of the coolest signs that, that we're progressing and we're moving spiritually. Said, I begin to forget about the crowd. You got to get over the crowd. That's, that's really the second thing. We better move because I'm, I'm running out of time. I got to get to vacation. Amen. So, <laughs> got to get over the crowd, man. That's the other thing. Zacchaeus. Here's Zacchaeus. Between Zacchaeus and Jesus is, is the crowd. And they're a rather self-righteous bunch, right? Because, because the end of the story, as we read, is that Jesus and Zacchaeus go off together. And people start to mutter and to murmur under their breath. And they're, they're talking back and forth. Can you see that he's going to hang out with this dude who does not deserve to be in the presence of this great teacher, this Messiah? How is that even fair? And besides, look how undignified he was in his approach to Jesus. He climbs a tree. Grown men don't climb trees. Sometimes people have a hard time getting to Jesus because of the crowd. I pray that we would not be a church of the crowd, right? I pray that you and I don't find ourselves being part of the crowd. Now, this might hurt a little bit, but hang with me, and you'll forgive me. And if you don't, I'm going on vacation. So... But there's something that often happens in churches, and this church is no exception. There are, it's like people have, it's like people have their perfect pew, their perfect viewing spot for all that goes on the stage. And if they cannot sit in that exact same spot in that exact same pew, they just lose it. And it matters not that if there's someone there who's a visitor, maybe a stranger, never walked into these church, this church before, they will look at those people like, mm, you better get out of my seat. <laughs> it's true. It's true. That's when we are being the crowd. That's when we have ceased to be about Jesus and allowing those who are far from God to get up close and personal with this Jesus. That's when we've ceased to be about Jesus and we've become the crowd. Now there's a lesson in that for those who may be far from God and that is this. That is this, don't judge all Christians by the actions of one crowd member. If you if you are far from God, if you are like, hey, I'm not a church person. I don't know a whole lot about you guys. I, I, I'm not around you guys a whole lot. Please, please, please do not judge. Do not judge the whole of church and Christians by the actions of a couple of members 
of the crowd. In the same way that Zacchaeus was able to rise above the crowd, in the same way that Zacchaeus was not hindered by those uh, self-described believers and followers, neither should you. It may be that you have to seek and go directly to God. You have to go directly to his word. There's no barrier there. It may be that you have to rise above some of the silliness that we find in some of Christianity. Not all of Christianity, but there is indeed silliness, foolishness, self-righteousness, downright sin, if you will. That becomes a barrier to those seeking to be with God. And what a powerfully mature thing that the Zacchaeus does. He's young in his faith. Nevertheless, he moves ahead of the crowd. He finds a way to get to this Jesus. So again, if you are that person who doesn't know Christ, you got a few interactions with some Christians that were awesome, but there's a few Christians that you interact with, you're like, that's a turn off, don't want to be a part of that. Go seeking the Jesus of the Bible. Find a Bible, open it up. I'm convinced that, that God will reveal himself to you. He will demonstrate to you. He will show you that he is in fact this, this God that Zacchaeus was so attracted to. The experience of salvation, the experience of having our self-righteousness totally dismantled involves a run and a climb up a tree. But it also involves getting over the crowd. And some longtime church people still have to get over the crowd. Amen. The final thing is this, and probably the most important thing that Zacchaeus picks up on, and it fits in with our theme of meals, is that Zacchaeus went home. He took Jesus home. When he sat down, and he had a meal with, with Jesus. I love Zacchaeus' response because Jesus says, come on down, Zacchaeus. And immediately he responds. He gets down. And, and then, he, then he receives that invitation uh, because Jesus is, sort of says, hey, I'm coming to your house. He was self-invited very often. You have to look for those self-invitational -invita moments from Jesus. Some of, some of us who may not be close to God... God's always extending these sort of invitations to come and taste and see. Come check me out. It might be an invitation from a friend who goes to church all the time. It might be just God speaking directly to you through circumstances. But God's always inviting you to come on down, to get a little closer to him, to get to know him. God didn't demand from, from Zacchaeus instantaneous righteousness before he invited him to sit down. There were no prerequisites other than the fact that Zacchaeus was a scoundrel, <laughs> just like you and just like me. But to sit down with Jesus and to have a meal was scandalous because it said that Jesus was actually wanting to be friends with him, that Jesus wanted to, this relationship to go even further, that this wasn't just one little encounter with the big time sinner dude. This was going to be an ongoing relationship. That's what it meant to sit down in ancient times with someone was that this is not just a one-time deal. We're going to have a very special, very intimate relationship. And Jesus would go so far as to say that salvation has come, that freedom has come, that this sinner that everybody just sort of sees as the worst guy on the block, guess what? He's been set free. He's been delivered. He understands that his righteousness is nothing because he just, he gets that now for sure, especially compared to this Jesus guy. He understands that, especially as he gets up close and personal. And he's blown away by this Jesus. And I think in those moments, I think in those moments as he encounters this Jesus up close and personal, which is what he started out wanting to do in the first place, that he becomes one of these fully devoted Christ followers. Because generally what follows when someone becomes a fully devoted Christ follower 
is sacrifice. Is an enormous sense of being willing to give whatever it costs. And Zacchaeus says, whatever I've cheated people out of, I'm going to give them four times more. I'm, gonna, I, I'm willing to do whatever. I will, I will give, Jesus. I will give everything. But sitting down with Jesus signaled an acceptance of him. He was invited into the family. And Jesus says something very interesting. He is a child of Abraham. Woo! Everybody else assumed they were children of Abraham. They belonged here. They're part of the club. They're in. And Jesus announces that this one who had clearly betrayed Abraham and everybody else was, in fact, a child of Abraham. He is part of the family. He's your, he's your uncle that's got a sketchy little business on the side. But you walk, he's in. He's changing. And he's coming to family dinner. And his life has changed. What a beautiful thing. The truth of the matter is, it's all of our stories. It's your story, it's mine. The same Jesus who invited himself to Zacchaeus' house invites himself to your life and to mine. He wants to engage, he wants to love, he wants to fellowship, he wants to be with you. We'll end here. So, um, last week or so, I've had an opportunity to, to be with some friends, and um, uh, what, it's always enjoyable to go out to eat and enjoy meals with friends, right? And I, again, as, we, as we're in this series, I pray that you will take the time to do that. Spend some time with your friends, uh, invite somebody new to your house, invite them out during the week, something, just engage with, engage with one another. Um, I may even just kind of randomly walk up to you and invite you out to eat. It'll be, it, yeah, it'll be good. Um, we can do that in an effort to engage and to become close to one another. But I've had the opportunity to, to do that recently. There's a weird sort of moment, though, when you're out with friends. And um, I was out at uh, Hash House Go Go um, recently and with some friends. And I love the portions there, big portions. Amen. Um, lots of food you can eat there. And a great restaurant. So there's this weird moment, though, when you order, where you try to figure out, is this the moment where I interject that I'm going to cover my bill, they're going to cover their bill, right? That's not always understood, is it? So you get there, everything's cool. Would you like some water? Yes, I'll take some water. Are you ready to order? No. And then, but then you just start ordering. And so it's not clear. So who's going to pay for this? I mean, you kind of assume, well, I'm going to pay for mine, but they invited me, so who's going to cover? It gets really kind of weird. What's always fun is that somewhere during the course of the conversation is that, is that when your, your friend says, oh, I got you, I'll cover you. And as a pastor who makes very little money, I always go, yes, thank you, Jesus, right? That's what we do, right? And you do too, because they are picking up the tab, baby. And then you order bigger. So... Especially if it's a conference, dude. I go all in on that. But anyway, so, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. The God of the universe, as big a meal as you order, as big a mess as you make, he picks up the tab, picks up the bill. When you sit down and you get in relationship with the king of the universe, when you get, when you get with Jesus, when, you, when you're hanging with him, there's no awkwardness about whether or not you, can, you have to cover it or not or how much you got to have room on your credit card or in your, on your debit account. Because Jesus says, I got you. I covered it. You live in grace. You get to enjoy this meal debt free. Eat up. Enjoy. Get over having to pay something. Get over trying to have to be righteous enough. I was righteous enough for you. You're covered, paid in full. Eat up and enjoy. Father, thank you that you are a God who covers us. Thank you that you are a God who who chooses to associate with us despite the baggage that we have, despite the unrighteousness of our lives, despite the fact that we have been awful scoundrels. You choose 
to sit down and you chose to pay the price and you chose to make sure that we had enough and you continue to provide enough for us. Lord, may we indeed taste and see just how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen.